Well, good evening, everybody. And I wanna thank you so much for joining us this evening for the second installment of our Veteran Voices Program, where we hand it over to the veterans of the 1st Infantry Division to share their stories with us. Now, what I'm really excited about is while we wait for our guests to finish signing in, I'd like to take just a few seconds to go over what are some of our upcoming programs virtual uh, for the next month. So, of course, everybody's familiar with our popular Date with History series. Our next virtual Date with History is going to be on Thursday, September 2nd at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And that is going to be the author Benjamin Milligan, uh, whose book was recently featured today in the Wall Street Journal. And that is By Water Beneath the Walls, The Rise of the Navy Seals. So uh, we're going to be hearing a story about the Navy Seals this upcoming month. And I'm really looking forward to that one. The book is particularly good. All right. And of course, our October date with history, we're going to be taking a look at the life of J.R.R. Tolkien and the World Wars, particularly his service in World War One and the service of his sons in World War II. So that one's coming up on October 7th, and that is also online via Zoom. Now, for those of you who have been joining us with our Date with History series, um, tonight's presentation is a part of our year-long commemoration of the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, particularly the 1st Infantry Division's participation during Desert Storm. Um, so we've had previous programs. This is another wonderful one we're looking forward to. If you weren't able to catch any of our earlier virtual programs on Desert Storm, uh, i.e. Desert Storm Air War, or artillery warfare during Desert Storm, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to share some of those links out with you of additional Desert Storm programs. That being said, um, tonight's presentation, we're going to be hearing from veterans of the Battle of Norfolk. How the presentation is going to work is we're gonna start off with a brief introduction. We'll send it over to the veterans to tell their story. And then at the very end, it will be time for questions from you. So the presentation, feel free to drop in questions to us. We'll be getting to them at the very end. And you can ask us questions by using the chat button at the bottom of your screen or top of your screen, depending on how you have your Zoom set up. It looks like a little talking bubble, bubble like out of a comic book. Click on that. That's how you'll send me questions and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Now we've been pretty lucky on our Zoom. I say that as I knock my head, um, where we haven't had too many technical issues. We have a lot of speakers on the call tonight. So with that being said, I wanna get ask you guys to provide us with a little bit of grace. Should we encounter any technical issues? The internet, right? It doesn't always uh, work the way we like it to. That being said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over and we'll start off with some brief introductions. So uh, to my veterans on the call, I'll, I will call you out if you could let us know your name and uh, your role during the battle. And let's start off with, I'm gonna go with Bob Burns. Bob, can you share us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I, I'm uh, Bob Burns. I was a 30-year-old tank company commander at the Battle of Norfolk. I commanded Charlie Company, 234. All right. Ted? Yeah, I was a, a platoon sergeant under Bob Burns as his uh, infantry platoon. Excellent. Jerry? Uh, yeah, so I, my name's uh, Jerry Ellis. Uh, I was the uh, 234 Armor Scout Platoon Sergeant. I uh, was uh, worked directly under uh, Colonel Fontenot. And now, Jerry, of course, is our man of mystery today. Oh, uh, we we're having technical issues with his camera, so it's not your computer um, if we're not seeing Jerry, but don't worry. We have a photo of Jerry to share later. And Greg? <laughs> I'm Greg Fontenelle. I had the good fortune to command the task force 2nd Battalion, 34th Armor, in which these three uh, great Americans served. Excellent. So Greg, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Tell us a little bit more. Uh, I wanna just say uh, up front. yesterday, uh, we had a discussion amongst ourselves about how we felt about talking about this, given the withdrawal that's going on in Afghanistan. <laughs> we thought that it made sense to go on because even during uh, World, War I, uh, World War II, the 1st Infantry Division met and talked and shared its experiences with others at reunions during the war. What happened today at the Abbey Gate in Kabul uh, Airport doesn't change that. The end of wars are ugly, bad things happen to good people, and we know a, a lot of people lost their lives today, including Afghans, uh, eight American citizens, 11 Marines, and a Navy medic. And our heart goes out to them and to their families. Uh, 
I want to say also that it's important to try to share the experience. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes described his experience in the Civil War that he shared with other veterans as that we shared the incommunicable experience of war. And I've thought about that a lot ever since. And it, I believe, however in difficult it is to communicate the experience, it's vital to do so, so that people don't believe war is what they see on the Xbox or what they see in the movies. And they understand something about the nature of the human condition, the dystopian existence of a soldier in combat, or those youngsters that lost their lives today and the women and children who lost their lives today at the Abbey Gate. I want to say briefly too, the First Infantry Division is a proud organization. I'm wearing as much First Infantry Division swag as I could get on tonight. Uh, the First Infantry Division is more than 100 years old, founded in 1917. Its oldest unit is the Fifth Field Artillery, which uh, took, among other things, took a, a redoubt number 10 at the Battle of Yorktown. So they go back a day or two. The 16th United States Infantry Regiment, of which I have the honor to be an honorary member, in which Ted Bear served. Uh, stood in the line at Antietam and fought for the Union and against slavery in the Confederacy. The 1st Engineer Battalion, which uh, supported us in the penetration attack, was the earliest engineer battalion in the United States Army, founded with the 1st Sapper Company in 1848. The 34th Armor is the youngster among the crowd. We date only to World War II, but we haven't missed any war since, but Korea since then. The uh, other thing I wanted to say is that often this war is described as a 100-hour war. Uh, that is a misnomer. It's a mistake. It's, uh, it's also a terrible thing to say for the soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who showed up in August of 1990. For them, it was by no means a 100-hour 100, 100 war. The U.S. Air Force started flying combat missions in terms of actually bombing as opposed to merely patrolling on the 17th of January. My brother Warren flew his first F-111 strike mission the following day. He was mission director the first night. So it wasn't a hundred hour war. And the other thing I want everybody to understand is it wasn't easy. Living in the desert is hard even when no one is shooting at you. And we did have in fact, people shooting at us as well. I believe that we succeeded because we were a well-trained unit with high morale and we believed in what we were doing. During that, uh, that uh, time in the desert, we did a deliberate attack including a breach of prepared defenses. We assisted the forward passage of the 1st Armored Division of the United Kingdom Army. We conducted an exploitation uh, march to catch up with the rest of the force after we'd done the forward passage of 70 miles on the day. And then we went into a forward passage alliance to the 2nd Cavalry Regiment on the night of the 26th, immediately went into a hasty night attack. And I want to assure everyone that no one practiced live fire night attacks at the National Training Center or anywhere in the United States. So the first time we ever got to do a night attack was against a live fire interactive combat force called the Iraqi Republican Guard and the 37th Armored Brigade of the Iraqi Army. <clears throat> Following that, we went into the pursuit, heading towards the, uh, the blue as the seventh Corps commander gave an order that said head for the blue. And that's what we did because we were too tired to think of anything else. We also dealt in war termination, including working with refugees and the defense of Kuwait. Quickly, uh, the breach began, and this picture that's up there now is uh, tanks on the way to the breach. The white smoke you see in the distance is a smoke screen and white phosphorus that I had fired to screen us uh, to prevent the Iraqis from seeing us as we approached. Can I have the next one, please? This is the trench as we passed it. Uh, this happens to be where we didn't uh, actually breach. So you can see none of the trenches have been caved in, but you can see uh, by this time, uh, the pick, the Iraqis had either been captured or had been killed or wounded. And so uh, that's a picture taken from one of Ted Bear's Bradley's. Next chart, please. This is one of Bob's tank platoons. It's second platoon, uh, Charlie Company, second battalion, 34th armor, after the breach heading out past and you can see other tanks in the, uh, in the, in the background. Uh, we went from there to a night forward passage alliance. So I wanna talk about that very briefly and then I'll turn it over to Jerry Ellis. <coughs> Next chart, please. So on the night of the 26th, we moved out at six o'clock in the morning. You can see that uh, we arrived at a reserve position thinking we weren't gonna go anywhere and boom, we got orders to go. The little picture on the left is the uh, a picture taken from uh, 
I think that might also be from Benny McRae's tank, but I'm not sure. Benny McRae was in second platoon, Charlie Company. This is the task force on the way up. The picture on the right was painted by my, my Marine Corps friend, um, and it is what the night looked like. The only thing wrong with this, with this painting is there aren't nearly enough fires. There were a lot more fires, and the vehicles were closer together. But Daryl, my Marine buddy, said, you can't do that, Greg. It'll, it's not good art. So we have good art, but, but the colors are just right. We did a hasty attack to attack the Talcana Mechanized Division and the 37th Brigade of the 12th AD. I'll show you a quick map to orient you. Next chart. This map shows uh, from top to bottom, you see horizontal lines lining left to right or west to east. At the very top is Bravo Troop 14 Cav and Alpha Troop 14 Cav. And you can see a boundary with the upper right mark showing a third armor division to the north. But uh, we had Alpha Company or Alpha Troop and Bravo Troop screening us until the third AD caught up. You can see lines that are at a different angle that show the 29th Mechanized Brigade in the upper left, the 9th Armored Brigade, then the 18th Mechanized Brigade of the Tawakalna, and finally the 37th Mech Brigade of, uh, of a different unit, I uh, forget what the name of the Armor Division was. The two uh, brigades attacked online, the 1st Brigade, 1st uh, first Brigade, 1st Infantry Division in the north, and you see from top to bottom, Delta Team 516 Infantry, if you'd go to that, please, uh, Laura. Just, uh, just at the top, keep going, keep going. Come down to D Company, to lower left. Come there down. we go. There we go, Delta we go. Company, Thanks. it's a company team, two infantry platoons, one mechanized, or one tank platoon. Then you see Bob Burns team, C Team, two tank platoons, one mech platoon. B, B Company, which was a B Team rather, two tank, one mech trailed by the reserve uh, a, a team of the 5th Battalion, 16th Infantry. The two scout sections on the right were, uh, were maintaining contact with uh, the 134 Armor, which attacked Pure. And then farther south, you see other company team formations of the 3rd Brigade, 2nd Armor Division, which happened to be the 3rd Brigade of our division. They were attached to us. So what you had here was a, an attack with 232 tanks authorized. We, might, we had one or two that were not operating that night and uh, uh, 58 times two, uh, 116 uh, Bradley. So we had a heavy tank force, uh, which was appropriate for attacking the tanks. I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry Allison, let him tell you what the scout platoon was doing that night on, uh, on the 26th and 27th of February. Jerry, would you take it? Yes, sir. Uh, well, as uh, the Colonel stated, I was a scout platoon sergeant and uh, the job of my scout platoon was well, we'll call it connecting this year between the uh, 234 armor and the 134 armor so that we could stay online. Um, that's that's paramount when you're, you're executing a mission, especially of this magnitude. And our second uh, mission in my mind was to ensure that uh, no hostiles slip through that that gap because we, you know, we were kind of spread out. Uh, to ensure that no hostiles uh, slip through the that gap right there, and then uh, boom, you got your enemy behind you and in front of you. That's uh, not good news. And that was a smart thing for Colonel Fontenot to do. Um, in my personal opinion, our, we had, there was no business to have scouts out front. I mean, our intel was pretty much impeccable. Uh, so that's all I have to say, sir. Thank you, Captain Burns, Colonel Bob. Bob retired as a colonel, so he. We have this thing. He calls me Colonel Greg. I call him Colonel Bob, but it's Bob and Greg. Bob. Um, well, you know, when I think about this night, I mean, to to sort of preface this, because uh, we're going to get into the forward passage of lines here, I think, and and so we had been through this long road march to get up there, and we were supposed to go into an attack position, and that didn't work out. We ended up essentially launching out of there very quickly and doing this forward pass. When we do this forward passage of lines, it's in contact at night through second cav and we're road mart or we're moving up to the north and we're going to make a right turn and we're going to go eastbound. So am I getting too far ahead of where you want to no, be you're in this fine. presentation? No, you're good. Okay. So, so we, we're going to make this uh, right turn eastbound. We pass through second cav. Um, 
you, you can't see the stars. It, it's smoke and overcast and, you know, visibility on the surface is good, but you can't see uh, anything above you. Um, my tank team had two GPSs. I'd given one to the first sergeant to run logistics with, and I had the only other one. And we had uh, pretty much long run past our maps. Uh, of course, there's no compasses in the tanks back then. And so, um, you know, what happens next as we do this forward pass through 2ACR, I'm trying to find the left flank of, of 134 Armor uh, so I can get my uh, tank company, you know, online with everybody else. And, and so the very next thing that happens is I make a huge mistake. I'm exhausted, uh, disoriented as I come through, and I'm trying to find that, that left flank. And I, am, you know, I, I keep pushing to the left. I keep pushing up to the north. And uh, unknown to me at the time, um, I'm actually uh, turning left. And I turn something like a full 270 degrees to the left. You know, it's extremely dangerous. We're right in front of second calf. Uh, they're in contact with the enemy. And the very next thing that happens, you know, in time here is we're in contact with the enemy. And so I've got, uh, I've got my two tank platoons uh, and I've got the infantry platoon following them. And I'll just, before I turn this over to Ted Bear for a moment, I'll, I'll just say the very next thing I know is I'm disoriented. I've got my loader out on the ground with a compass. I come him back, bring him back. He gives me a bearing that doesn't make any sense to me, you know, as we're trying to figure this out. And, uh, and I will just say also, you know, all I had to do was ask for help. We had never done this before, <laughs> done anything like this before. Scouts are over there on the right flank. I've got a fantastic uh, platoon leader over there on the right. I've got lots of people to help me. I just have to ask for help. And ultimately, it's all those other guys that, uh, that bring this thing together and fix the problem. <clears throat> but the next thing I know is there's, there's 25 millimeter chain gun tracer flying right over the top of my hatch and all around my tank. Uh, we are in contact with, uh, with enemy infantry or dismounts on the ground. And these guys want to fight. And Ted, I think it's a good time to turn it over to you for a moment. Yeah, when we ran into them, uh, there were several RPG teams that uh, Lieutenant Homer took out one. He emptied about six or seven rounds of AP on him, and my gunner took out another one. And then I know he had some rounds hit the back of his tank, but it was either that or taking an RPG in there. So I dismounted some soldiers. Uh, we engaged some, some just threw up their hands and we told them go that way. I hope that was the right way, but we told them go that way and took all of their weapons and uh, basically threw them in the t uh, Bradleys. And then we got uh, back on the Bradleys and continued to march. Well said. And for those of you that don't know what an RPG is, it's a rocket propelled grenade and an AP round is an armor piercing round, which is what uh, Homer had. Uh, Bob Burns, by the way, took offense at being shot at by Homer, but we explained to Bob, or Homer did, that he it was either that or he got shot by the RPG. Uh, I want to just add one, one quick thing. Uh, all four of us served until retirement. We were all retired soldiers. Bob Burns uh, later took the experience he developed here in the desert, took it back to Iraq in 03, and he commanded a cavalry squadron in the 2nd Cavalry Regiment, the unit we passed through for, uh, was it 14 or 15 months in Iraq, Bob? 15 months, sir. So a long time. Ted retires at first sergeant. Uh, Jerry Ellis uh, had a distinguished career in the Army and in the Marine Corps and then went to work in the civil service. Uh, the rest of the story is the exploitation to the coast. We weren't done fighting. We had another couple of gunfights on the way out. And by the time uh, ceasefire came uh, around, uh, I think you could say we were all well toasted and this need to be lightly buttered because nobody slept for at least uh, for most of the 84 hours. That's our story and we're sticking to it, Laura. That's it. 
Excellent. All right. I do want to open up for some guests to um, engage us with questions. Um, but before I do that, so know that you can start submitting questions, I do want to go over a little bit more about the um, the images that you gentlemen shared with me. Um, can we talk a little bit about some of the photographs you shared? Sure. Where do you want to start? Let's start with the one that we're looking at right now. This is a photograph of the of the senior staff and officers of the 2nd Battalion, 34th Armor. The most experienced soldier in this crowd is Sergeant Major Vern McComb. He is uh, right above the, the chipper looking captain you see in the very front with his hand on another shoulder, another soldier's shoulder. That's it? Vern. Vern was a Dominican Republic veteran, uh, a couple of tours in Vietnam, and I was his 5th Battalion commander. He had been Sergeant Major in five battalions and I was uh, honored to have him. Bob Burns is that handsome young fellow on the far left front row. Ed Sauer is the soldier next to him. I won't name them all. Uh, okay. John Bushyhead, a Cherokee Indian, is the guy next to him. John, by the way, speaks Korean, Russian, German, and Georgian. Johnny G. Womack is the African-American soldier right next to me in the front row. That's Johnny. And Juan Toro is next to him, and Juan's dad was an officer in the Chilean Navy. I won't name the rest of these guys, but they're all great Americans, uh, and I'm proud to have served with them. I do want to mention the guy in the upper left in the back row was our chaplain. He was a combat infantryman in Vietnam, served in the infantry and during that war, got out and went to divinity school and happened to be our chaplain. And I can tell you, he baptized a lot of people on Easter uh, that year. That's all I have to say about that, ma'am. Ah, Jerry, I uh, can't, Jerry can't see this, but the guy cutting. Yes, I can. Oh, can you see it? Yeah, go ahead and talk, Jerry. Well, here's Jerry, by the way. No, Jerry's cutting hair. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jerry's cutting hair. <laughs> yeah, that's my uh, platoon leader, uh, Lieutenant uh, McComb. Uh, I decided he needed a haircut. Uh, he didn't get one of those nice high and tights that I made everybody get before we left the entire platoon. I had a good picture of my uh, of, uh, my Bradley uh, crew. Uh, I guess it didn't make it in the mix, but uh, yeah, we had to all get our hygiene going. <laughs> well done, Jerry. <laughs> hey, yeah, Ted, talk you... about that. Yeah, Ted, well, you sent that, me this. That's my crew there. That's uh, uh, Johnny Reed with one knee on the ground. He was a, he was a good gunner and uh, a couple drivers, long drivers, Chris, Chris Baker, uh, Terry Tabowski, Lieutenant Homer is that guy right there. And uh, is I he can't dead? recognize all of them. It's okay. Hey, tell us about your, uh, your bathtub and wash tub there on the side of the Bradley. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, we had two of them. That's the bathtub we had. And then we had a uh, five gallon bucket. It was a blue bucket. And uh, we put padding on the top and then taped that down with 100 mile an hour tape. And that became, that became our commode. It was a nice and comfortable one too. That, that turquoise tub that you can see, right? That's the one we, Every well, not every tank crew, almost every tank and Bradley crew had one. We didn't have enough to go around. You washed your clothes and yourself in that, so you can see how many guys use that. Uh, you can tell there would have been significant competition. Uh, except for excuse me, except for you, sir. You had the you had the I had a bathtub, but I chose not to send that photograph <laughs> <laughs> at the you end of the war. Time. You did one time, sir. Yeah, well, I'm not going to show it here. There we go. Thanks, Jerry, for bringing that up. I had to. I'm sorry. No. All right. So this actually leads into a good question that we had. Um, a lot of our guests who are familiar with the Battle of Norfolk have seen the film, uh, the film we have about it in our Duty First gallery. So that's where a lot of our guests are familiar with this battle. And in that in that video footage, you are you are riding along in a Bradley fighting vehicle. Could you tell us a little bit more about the different types of tanks and vehicles you had along with you? Jerry or Bob or Ted, how about taking that? That's that's one of my Bradleys there. As you can see the the two cylinder things on the side are tow missiles. 
had a 25 millimeter chain gun on it and a coaxial. Uh, we also had uh, uh, phosphorus grenades on the side that we never <laughs> used, but they were there. Uh, we could get comfortably eight people in there. So the army decided to put 12 in there and that's what we went with. Uh, let me point out a couple things on that, Bradley. Does, if you see the Maltese cross just to the left of the uh, inverted V, that is the symbol of the fifth Corps of the Army of the Potomac in which the 16th served and that's their mark. The uh, arrow pointing up, the chevron pointing up <coughs> is the coalition wide uh, symbol for friendlies. 2-4 means uh, that's the second battalion, two uh, of, the, of, of those listed. He listed the battalions. Infantry is uh, on the left, uh, the right of the line. So they got listed first. And four means D company. And, and so you can see that that is a coalition vehicle belonging to the second battalion. If you happen to know that in the first division lexicon, that would be fifth, 16th. And four means it's Delta company. <coughs> so those symbols all mean something over. Excellent. That guy there was our take recovery guy. He was a, a real good guy. His name was uh, Tony Britton, very good guy. And still stay in contact with him day to day because he fixed our Bradleys multiple times. So who are for the, the, the support teams? And Tony still works at Rock Island Arsenal for the U.S. Army repairing. No, he, uh, he, he got retired. retired. He retired and now he's working a farm. Well, there you go. And that is a 50 caliber machine gun designed by John M. Browning. It's been in use uh, since World War I and there's no reason to replace it because it's a really good weapon. I might add the only difference in the uh, firepower between, uh, I'm sure between the infantry and the scouts where we had the tow missiles, is that correct, sir? No, the scouts, the, the, the infantry had them too. Oh, yeah, I, I did not know that. That's a great point, though. First tank kill uh, in, in, the, uh, in the task force. I think it was one of yours, wasn't it, Jerry? Uh, that, would be me, sir. that would be me, sir. Tow missile kill at 3,200 meters. It was a thing of joy and beauty forever since tanks can kill us. I actually flew that missile myself, sir. You did a great job, pal. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, everybody. Um, so I do have a couple of questions coming in. So I want to go ahead and start getting to those. So one of the questions was, um, what lessons did the Army learn from some of your experiences in Desert Storm and the Battle of Norfolk that you think enhanced our abilities as we entered the War on Terror? Well, I'll tell you, one of the best things the Army went to was to go to a uh, task organized uh, unit already task organized instead of just crossing over and sometimes you're not ready to work with people you are. So they, they've straightened that out. Together. Peace mailing it together, Ted. That's what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the current tank battalion, 234 Armor, is two tank companies and one mechanized infantry company. And the the 16th Infantry Battalion in the same uh, brigade is two infantry companies, one tank company. So it's permanently combined arms. Bob, you got anything you want to add to that? Well, one significant change that occurred uh, between my time as a tank company commander in Desert Storm and being a, a 40 year old uh, cavalry squadron commander in Iraqi Freedom was situational awareness. We had Blue Force Tracker uh, during Iraqi freedom. And uh, it, it wasn't a perfect solution, but it was, it was better than having nothing. And at least it gave you, you know, a, a, an idea of where the, you were and where friendly forces were. And it was just a great uh, backstop, you know, for your own navigation and orientation. Yeah, Blue Force Tracker uh, is a ground-based uh, system that allows friendlies, uh, it's almost like having a transponder or identification friendly foe you can see the other friendly vehicles. In fact, during that, during Bob's war, I was in the third floor of the Combined Arms Research Library on a 
uh, classified computer system watching the attack into Baghdad. So the <clears throat> other thing I would say happened uh, during Desert Storm that we that we tried to fix and have largely fixed with brute force tracker is not shooting at each other. In that war, we could see farther than we could identify vehicles accurately. That's because thermal imagery isn't nearly as good in fidelity as it looks like on your Xbox playing Call of Duty. So <laughs> we, we actually killed other Americans, uh, not we personally, but uh, we had friendly fire incidents more often than, would have, uh, than was acceptable. Uh, anything else, fellas? I think the other lesson I'd say we learned is combat medicine is far better in uh, OIF, OEF than it was at that time with these pressurized compression bandages and so forth. We got a bandage now, you get a traumatic injury, a big hole in somebody's body, you stuff that thing in and it's like a sponge. It kind of expands and it saves a lot of lives, uh, including tra uh, traumatic amputation and the like. Okay, Laura, back to you. And um, this next question is kind of on the same wavelength of what we've been talking about. And in the in your experience, you were saying that during the Battle of Norfolk, this was you uh, participated in like night live firing, and it was something that you hadn't experienced before, trained for. Um, do you feel that we did we learn any lessons from that? Is that something that we started uh, training for well, in NBC afterwards? The great mm -hmm. irony, no, they still don't train live fire at the National Training Center. The great irony is uh, it's too dangerous to do in peacetime, but it's perfectly acceptable to do it in wartime. Uh, I, at more than once that night, thinking, uh, I, I've told people it's like a, a Salvador Dali painting. If anybody's seen Salvador Dali's painting of, of watches melting and, and dripping down a wall, uh, he was called a surreal artist. And that's what the night was like. I'm thinking, how is it it was too dangerous to train at the National Training Center, but it's perfectly okay to attack these guys at night? Trust me, that went through my mind more than once because I was certain when Ted's guys dismounted, you could see tracers going in every direction. I was certain he had lost people. In fact, he had not. And the guys that he uh, took control of came out in a column of twos marching in step because they didn't want to make anybody angry with them after what Ted had done. <laughs> All right. In the in the presentation, you showed us some really wonderful photos of your fellow soldiers. And if you could just touch on a little bit about um, the importance of inclusivity during this time, specifically during this war with brotherhood and sisterhood, as we started seeing women um, coming closer and closer to the battle zone. Can I, can I say something to that last question real quick? Absolutely, Jerry. Go ahead. You know, one other thing that, uh, I mean, we have training on how, you know, how to conduct yourself with prisoners of war and stuff like that but you know my my platoon's first contact with prisoners of war were about 30 or 40 or 50 guys with weapons mm. coming towards us holding white flags up mm. and uh you know we, we weren't prepared to, for that you know the the only thing i could tell my guys was if they make a move for the weapon, shoot them. We don't care about the white flags. I mean, I'm not going to have any of my guys killed because you got a white flag. You know, I, I was ill prepared for that. I did not even have a clue how to uh, how to deal with that. That's a great point. That stumped us all. We kept, we had 250 sets of uh, uh, manacles. And we used them all in the first day. And after the, we actually took 1,400 odd prisoners. But uh, the thing I'm most proud of is the 2nd Battalion, 34th Armor, the task force, including the two companies from the 16th Infantry, did not kill anyone unnecessarily. We didn't shoot uh, any prisoners. We didn't abuse anybody. Uh, we went short food and water because the soldiers in that task force showed great compassion. You asked about the bonding. We crossed the line of departure with 1,010 people. 1,009 of them were men. One of them was a four foot 11 young woman who could run the Senator, which is a machine that puts out, uh, it's kind of like a car wash on wheels. And uh, she was a, a really fantastic young woman. I, and you can imagine how isolated she must have been, but she was treated well by her brothers in arms. And the bonds are strong. Uh, Jerry and I talk quite often. Ted and I talk. 
Bob and I are going to have lunch together with one of his platoon leaders on Saturday. Uh, we have reunions every other year. And uh, Tony Thumper Britton, the recovery vehicle mechanic, uh, I talk to him often. I, it's a very tight group. We have shared the incommunicable experience of war, and that is an enduring uh, bond that you form. I love these guys, and I think they love me back. And when we aren't on video, it's Greg and Bob and Ted and Jerry instead of Colonel and Sir. Over. All right. Um, I just wanted to let you gentlemen know that we have a, um, a medic who left us a message that he learned so much from these guys and they helped him uh, better prepare for casualties for soldiers in Afghanistan. So thank you so much for your service and your comment. Um, Greg, can you talk to us a little bit more about any command or control issues that the Devil Brigade might have had to deal with? Well, there were plenty of them. Uh, right, right at the beginning, John Bushy had the large Ch Cherokee Indian that you saw in the front row. Uh, he and I went to uh, an intermediate objective uh, to uh, also a place where we felt that I could see from so that we could support the breach by fire. And when we got up there, the Iraqis had done the same terrain analysis I had and, and hit us with uh, about 12 rounds of 122 millimeter howitzer. And it, <laughs> frightened, it frightened my radio to death. I could not talk to anybody on the, the task force net. I could talk to brigade, but... The task force did, it was my great moment in history. I was going to say, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, or, you know, something glorious and patriotic, but I didn't get to say anything. And my guys did the fight without me, and they did just fine without me. They executed perfectly. So I was, uh, I was not in control of my task force for about eight minutes, but I had full command of it because they knew what was needed to be done, and they did it without having to be told. And I, I'm also very proud of that, the fact that I was not absolutely necessary. Now, yesterday, Jerry and I talked, both of us, and I think, uh, I think I actually gave an order to the effect, nobody's to fight buttoned up. You got to be able to see what's going on around you. Button up means hatch down. I, that whole night at Fright Night, I was up, uh, you know, way up above where you're supposed to be. I was about waist high in the tank turret. Outside Amen. Of the tank, so I could see what the hell was going on. And what I was concerned about is where were my guys in relation to each other? They had thermal images. I did too, but you can't see anything from the thermal image beyond the panoramic view that you have, which is pretty limited. So for me to control the battalion, I stayed out where I could see it. And I'd let these guys fight their fight. And we tried to advance deliberately. So we would move until we saw targets. We would stop. We would divide the targets, and the way we did it is uh, every target got two tanks to shoot at it, and we did it by volley fire so the other side couldn't detect very readily what we were doing. Bob, you want to add to that, or Ted, either one of you, or Jerry? I well, I mean, just, just a quick comment. Ted. Go ahead, Ted. Uh, the only thing that I can remember is when the tanks were firing, we were firing too, and I'm yelling at my gunner, uh, Eddie Taylor, to f start firing, and he just, you know, looked at me and said, "I've been firing," because the tanks are so loud. It's it's unbelievable, even over a even over a chain gun. Well, what's odd from my perspective is I don't remember hearing a single bang. All I, I remember the light show and I remember what it smelled like. And the smell of a battlefield is horrific. Uh, the, when Iraqi tanks got hit, they blew up dramatically. And the odor of burning fuel, uh, burning uh, propellant, burning humans, all of that was just, it was God awful. I never want to smell, but honest to God, I never heard a single sound except the radio. Mm. Jerry, you were going to say something. Mm, no, sir, I was not. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the next question we have from our guests is a sensitive question. So uh, if you don't feel comfortable um, talking further on this topic, we all understand and respect that decision. Um, so in the exhibit that we have at the First Division Museum on the Battle of Norfolk, guests listen to actual radio chatter from the battle. Um, and in that chatter um, is discussed the issue of friendly fire. Can you talk to us a little bit more about um, how many we may have lost to friendly fire during the battle? And can you break down how that happens? 
why don't I start and then you guys can add to it because I've written about it and studied it. Uh, the first friendly fire incident would, and it's in the Bradley exhibit. You can hear uh, a, a tanker in B Company, 1st Battalion, 34th Armor, seeing a target, I think it was 1,560 meters or something. And, and one of the things I told my guys, we, we engaged no targets beyond 1,500 meters. And the reason we didn't is you cannot identify with the thermal imagery accurately. Identify means you know it's a tank and you know it's one of theirs. 1,500 meters is the max that you can see. And that night, because of the what's called uh, electro-optical infrared crossover caused by clouds and precipitation and smoke, it was even harder. I, I don't think they should have shot because I don't think they could identify it, but they did. And the round went, fortunately, through the back door of a Bradley and out the floor of the Bradley without getting into the crew compartment because the Bradley was climbing up a little rise. Now, everybody in that Bradley <laughs> suffered burns and wounds, but nobody was killed. The cargo, the, hatch, was open. the cargo hatch was open too, sir. Yeah, and that, and that made a difference because that cargo hatch, I mean, that meant the fire could get out of there. People could get out of there, even more important. Well, that, uh, tank, that tank was sitting 25 feet to my right, the one that flamed for, the brain. I forgot that, Jerry. I should have had you talk about it. I was Pick hanging it out. I was sitting, I was hanging out of the, you know, I, I was like you, there's no, I'm not riding buttoned up, especially with the thermal sites in a Bradley. I mean, they were completely inferior to the ones that in, in the M1 tanks. And, and e even at that, I, it, like you said, the field of view, I couldn't stand it. You know, it, I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it. I had to be up where I, I could see what was going on. You know, I, I had real good night vision and, uh, but I could see more than that night vision site could see, you know, in, in, the, in the full spectrum of, of my view. Um, and, um, yeah, I was hanging out of the hatch and uh, that Bradley, that tank fired. You could tell it was a, a heat round. And um, my we're gunner. Lucky it, we're lucky it wasn't any worse than it was. Heat, by the way, is high explosive in any tank. And my gunner said, Sergeant Ellis, they just flamed that Bradley. So I got down and looked in my sight, and that's when you could see the little hot people bailing out of the top and stuff. And, yeah, it's miraculous that nobody, you know, got uh, killed in that deal right there. However, minutes later, we lost a, a soldier and had another badly wounded. Glenn Burnham, Glenn Burnham the platoon leader, uh, of the scout platoon and 134 armor went over to shield that vehicle from where he thought the fire was coming, which was from the north, uh, from the north, when in fact it had come from uh, the west. So when he got over there, he saw three large machine gun rounds coming in. And, and trust me, I've seen them come in at me. You can see them all the way in. He saw three, one went over, one entered his uh, turret and a big flash. And a third he saw hit short. And the, the one that hit him, him took about three inches of his femur out and it killed Sergeant Douth at his gunner. Now that was the only death we had in, in the first brigade. And, and it's possible that some of the guys in 134 think it was Juan Toro's infantry platoon and my B team. I didn't see anybody shooting in the task force at the time, but the truth is no one knows. Glenn thinks the shots came from the Northwest um, I'm sorry, from the Northeast, which would have made him enemy. But the truth is, I, I don't know who did it. Now, in the in the 3rd Brigade, 2nd Armored Division, they had a bunch of uh, fratricides that night. Uh, the 2nd Battalion, 66th Armor, shot up uh, at least one Bradley. I don't remember how many they killed. And they shot up two uh, M1 tanks or three M1 tanks. Uh, if any of you own the book that I wrote, there's a picture of uh, a book about Desert Storm that I wrote. There's a picture of Captain Hedge's tank. He was one of the ones that got hit. I happen to know one of those guys, got to know him quite well. Uh, he got hit uh, badly enough and burned badly enough that he had to have a lot of blood. And, he, and as a consequence, he had hepatitis C and had to have a liver transplant ultimately. And yet he is a happy guy. Uh, he does not uh, blame anybody. And I just wish I could be the kind of man that, that he is to go through what he did, all the pain and surgeries that he went through and survive it and then do a liver transplant and survive that. 
So yes, we had a problem with fratricide. There were, there were more of them than seemed acceptable given how quick the war had gone at the ground. But the, the fact of the matter is fratricide's long been a problem as much as 25% of the casualties in certain fights of World War II were fratricide, uh, including things like the, the bombardment at the beginning of Cobra killed more than 400 Americans, including Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair. So fratricide's not new. It will never go away entirely. Bob Burns pointed out Blue Force Tracker saved a lot of lives in OIF, OEF. That's Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. And thank God for it, but it isn't. It isn't going to solve it completely. Well, it's like it's like you said, sir. You, when you have a machine that can reach out and touch somebody twice as far as you can identify who they are, or or further, and you're a youngster, <laughs> you know. We were all. I mean, I don't know, but my adrenaline was. I mean, when we stopped the next day, <clears throat> we stopped. And well, I, actually, I actually passed out in the turret. I, I, woke up, I woke up and I'm slumped over, sticking out of the turret. And I go, man, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I know a lot of people are listening, but it really freaked me out because I'm, I mean, I thought, oh, God, oh, God. I mean, I really did. I jumped up. And, oh, oh, God. Oh, you know, because I knew what we had been doing. And then I knew what I had been doing for no, no telling how long being passed out from exhaustion. I, it, it just scared the, scared the bejesus out of me is what I'm saying. I didn't know where I was, who had me or anything. I got a story on that also. As we were going into the, the night attack, it was still daylight. And that's when we passed one of the uh, Bradleys that had been hit. And I saw a boot there. And then at that point, and it just, it, I didn't real take it serious it until real that real time. <laughs> and then, then I thought, okay, I know why we're here now. Now, I can't say I didn't take it serious, but I looked a lot harder at being uh, who I was. So, so fratricide was a problem. There's no question about it. Yeah, and I, I, as before we move on, I want to acknowledge we had a, a guest who agreed that this is a sensitive issue, but we should not be afraid to discuss it. Um, this, guest, this guest was in Delta Company, and I, I couldn't agree more. It's a tough subject, but I want to thank you for sharing it with us this evening. All right. Um, we have a guest who wanted to know, have any, or have any of you personally, if you're willing to share this with us, or have any of the men you've served with, are they dealing with Gulf War illness issues? And can you speak to any of the chemical weapons that may have been used against us? Well, Task Force 234 Armour, and in fact, almost all of the 1st Infantry Division and a couple of other units were in the downwind, uh, downwind hazard of an ammunition dump that was blown up uh, after the war that had chemical munitions in it. Uh, I have had chronic fatigue. Uh, I was diagnosed uh, pretty early in my pretty young age and not overweight with sleep apnea. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's connected or not. I couldn't be sure of that. Um, I, I'll let the others speak for themselves. I can tell you that I suffered from that and I have been suffering from it uh, due to PTSD and and the different, the shakes I get on, on certain days and my stability. I have to have a service dog that, that helps me walk now. And I blame all that on that, uh, the, the chemical weapons that was told that we didn't have, they didn't have. So I, I, I'm really angry about that. Well, also, we breathed oil fire smoke steadily at for various how many weeks, times. For how many for weeks, sir? Weeks. <laughs> You'd blow yeah. your nose, it would be the same color of the oil smoke, which was to say jet black. You couldn't you'd see your hand in front of your face. Absolutely. And you'd cough that stuff up, and they would tell you it won't hurt you. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that this is not good for me if smoking's not good for me. But but there you go. I'm, the, the truth is we don't, the science isn't there yet. Uh, right now, uh, there are certain conditions that the VA will tell you is presumptive uh, if you have been exposed to the downwind hazard. 
just as Agent Orange turned out to be a presumptive cause of any number of cancers. I had breakfast today with a guy who had myeloma cancer from it. I have a friend who died from prostate cancer and everybody I know from Vietnam who had exposure to that has either had prostate cancer or some other cancer. I think we're gonna find out more about this as time goes on. And we had some other guests who share in those sentiments. And again, um, just making sure you check with your VA for updated lists of causes. So make sure you're checking up on that. Um, I have a guest who had a question about um, the 100 hour war. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but can you expand on uh, kind of this misnomer of the 100 hour war and what goes into the lead up to the crossing of the line of departure or the LD? Well, I'll take the first part of that because I, I, I've studied it. Uh, within hours of the Saudis approving- You wrote uh, books on it. What do you mean you studied yeah, it? Yeah, I wrote a book on it. So <laughs> within hours of uh, the Saudi, the King of Saudi Arabia approving uh, the, the coalition arrival, F-15s flew in. Uh, within a few more hours, the 82nd uh, started in Within uh, a few more hours of that, the United States Navy and uh, nearby Marine Corps expeditionary units were in. Hoorah. And they were all there. Yeah, Jerry used to be a Marine, but we forgave him for that. Uh, within within days. You're lucky, you, you're lucky you can't see me. I have my Marine Corps dress blues on. I was trying to get this. There you go. Within, within days, they had the 82nd Airborne, the 101st. They had a, attack helicopters and lots of fighters. We moved 350,000 troops to get the first entry division there. It took 600 trains from Fort Riley uh, with, uh, with no railheads. So the engineers, including uh, the first engineers, built a railhead, pushed sand up and built ramps so you could drive up on the flat cars. Then we loaded all the ships. The first entry division had 11 uh, vessels to, 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 to transport its stuff. Once we got there, you had to get the hell out of the port, which was not easy. And in fact, the largest casualty uh, event we had was a Scud missile in the port. So everybody wanted out of the port to get from the port to the assembly area. The only way I could describe it is if you've seen the Mad Max movies, that's what the road to the- The, high, the highway, highway of death, sir. And it, it was the highway of death. And I've always believed if you, if you drove that highway, you deserved a combat patch. We killed a lot of people on that thing. And that got us to the assembly area. And I'll stop talking there and let these guys pick it up. <laughs> what else happened, Bob? Okay, Ted. <laughs> you, you know, I, I'm going to defer to the great NCOs that we got there, sir. There you go. Good idea. Well, I have to ask you, what was what what was the the situation? Well, you're up in the assembly area. You've arrived about three thirty or four o'clock in the morning, and it's raining. And then what happened? Uh, well, we made a phone call. Uh, my wife, my beautiful wife, she, she was the point of contact for all our soldiers, uh, wives and girlfriends and, and mothers and fathers. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as she got everybody updated, then we got her on the bus and that was the, the trip to hell at one point. <laughs> At one point, uh, Terry Tabowski had a gun pointed at, at the drivers, telling them to slow down, and everything worked out. But I, basically, we ended up in the middle of nowhere, and then people started showing up around us. Yeah, the convoy cool. release point, when I got up there at 3.30 in the morning on the 13th, leading the task force uh, tanks because my driver was dead tired and I was afraid he's gonna kill us. So I drove, there was a guy holding a cardboard sign uh, <laughs> yeah. MRE box and he'd drawn the first infantry division patch on it with a one and said, convoy stop here. So you were supposed to conclude mm -hmm. that that was the convoy release point. And yes, it was. And it was raining cats and dogs and God bless him for being there. Otherwise I might've driven all the way to Jordan. All right, I do want to be sensitive to our time. So I want to make sure we get to as many questions as possible. So um, let me get to this next one for you. 
How did the battle handover between your battalion and the second armored cavalry unit go? Was it clear to everyone when you took over the fight from the uh, second armored cavalry units to your rear? <clears throat> Who wants to try that one? Well, I'll tell you what, to me, uh, there, well, there were too many vehicles and too many people in one place to me. And you're talking the initial, when we, we did our initial movement to contact, was that what the question was referring when to? Our knife movement to contact? Forward passage lines through second right. cavalry. Yeah, movement to contact. Gotcha. Um, well, I think there were too many vehicles in one place, but I don't think it could be helped uh, because that was our sector. But here's here's my take on it. We we had, I mean, God, I don't remember how many hours we we had we had moved, and um, it was okay. It was uh, it was late in the day, you know, and it was okay. Uh, the word was uh, to go ahead and. Uh, set in for the evening that's the word that i got we set in you know we were sitting around in our t-shirts you know we had our security out of course but we were you know the people that weren't on we were sitting around in our in our t-shirts and it was like oh man we get a break and all that and then all of a sudden now you can't imagine <clears throat> well i don't know if, you know, emotionally you're drained your body's drained and you're down. Oh my goodness! Let's re it's time to get some sleep. And then all of a sudden, get your butts up in the vehicles. We're attacking. That is a. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you weren't there. I mean, I don't know. It, it was just a surreal, unreal ex thing that happened in my mind. It's like, goodness gracious! I mean, you're. I don't know your emotional level. I mean, you, you're like on a, I don't know what you would call it. It, it. It's emotionally, extremely emotionally taxing. And I don't believe if it wasn't for training and physical fitness that we wouldn't, you know, most, we wouldn't have survived. I mean, I believe in training and, you know, like the Colonel was saying, Colonel Bob, you know, he finally, he, he carried on and carried on and carried on and carried on till he got his, till he got oriented again. Okay. And that's because of training and he was physically fit. Yeah. He was exhausted. His mind was exhausted, but he never gave up. And, and I believe that that's, that was the crux of, 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 of our battalion right there. I mean, we were all extremely physically fit. We were extremely well trained. Yeah, we weren't. We never been shot at at night. We probably never been shot at at all, you know, unless you were on the street like I was, you know, back in the seventies, you know, a thug and stuff. But anyway, that was a joke, folks. But anyway, um, yeah, I didn't see anybody laughing. But... <laughs> in all fairness, we can't hear anybody either. It's a Zoom webinar. Yeah. So what, let me add something really quickly to that, Jerry. When we did, they gave us a passage point, which is doctrine. The second cavalry regiment knew how to do that. That's one of the things they did in the general defense plan for Germany. We knew how to do it because we assisted the British going through it. We got in the column like we were supposed to, but we could not get to the passage point because the battalion on our right went through in a, in a diamond formation. So, you know, that was his choice. We went through in the column and, and where we I, I got to the to the soldiers at the, uh, the the cavalry soldiers that had properly marked all their vehicles and said, guys, we aren't coming through at the passage point. This is how many vehicles. Get a hold of the squadron commander, tell them we're through. And I told uh, my XO to do the same. And we had an agreement. The the regimental executive officer had backed off. He'd broken contact, non doctrinal stuff. He he didn't quit shooting at people, but he backed off a little bit. So they were at the 7-0 Easting, which is an imaginary line on a map that runs north and south. And we crossed it heading east. And they agreed that we would own the fight as soon as we crossed the 7-0. So at 7-0, we, we had it. And then at 7-2 grid line is when we had our, our maybe between 7-1 and 7-2 is when Bob Burns started getting shot at. I shot a, a red star cluster for him. Then I had to shot another because 
damn it, Bob still needed one more. And that turned out by mistake to be a flare in which, in which caused all the Iraqis and anywhere in, in the neighborhood to shoot at me. But by then we owned the fight and the handover was done based on coordination between the command posts, coordination with the soldiers on the ground and an agreement on how far out we would be and where we would take over. And that's how it went down. And Jerry's point about getting off your, you know, going from dead rest to attack again is really hard to do. Yeah. And that is our story. I have some really wonderful veterans um, who are sharing their stories with us who are First Infantry Division veterans. Um, so I want to thank them all so much for sharing your stories with us. I'll try and get to as many of them as I can, uh, still honoring our end time. We do usually schedule this program from 8 o'clock end, but I'm willing to push it to an 8.15 if everybody, if you want to stay on with these gentlemen and we'll get through all these stories, I'm sure they're willing to hang out with us for 15 more minutes. I have one um, guest who says, do you remember the first days of clearing the berm and they have a memory of the dogs kept setting off the ground al ground alarms and the sleeping was just like terrible could you tell us that story yeah the yeah at one point the alarms were going off i don't know what for or whatever but i usually slept on the front of the bradley because of the 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 trim board flew down the, tr the trim van down. Yeah, the, it came down and it was a flat surface you sat on. Well, I woke up and I have, oh, probably six, eight, 10, 12 people around me all in Mop 4 saying, is he alive? <laughs> and uh, I looked up and said, yeah, but you better not wake me again. The thing with the dogs was uh, primarily because we had ground surveillance radar. <laughs> And there were these feral dogs that, that, that lived out there. There was, I don't know, half dozen, maybe eight. Or nine. Was, and, and we would pick them up on ground surveillance radar and we track them. I'm, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm looking at this, what kind of insane patrol are the Iraqis running? Because their, their route made no sense. Okay. Well, we finally figured out it was dogs. And uh, I hope I don't offend anybody, but we shot them, we killed them all. Uh, and then the only patrols we shot after that were no kidding Iraqis. I feel sorry about the dogs and I had to go around being called dog killer six for a whole bunch of days before people forgot about it with the next incident. But the, the dogs were definitely causing alarm uh, throughout the AO and, and I had them shot. We also uh, were told we hadn't, didn't have any UAVs working with us. And then uh, the UAVs kept flying over Harry Emerson's uh, 1st Battalion, 5th Artillery. And uh, we cleared it with the division, they cleared it with the Corps, and then Harry shot at them, and we did too. And then the 207th Military Intelligence Brigade asked us to quit shooting at their UAVs. Now they belonged <laughs> to 7th Corps, so I was kind of disappointed. 7th Corps didn't know they were flying over us, but lots of weird things happen when you got a green unit. We were well trained, but we were green, had not been in combat. The only combat veteran I think we had. No, we had two combat veterans in the battalion, Sergeant Major Vern McComb and uh, our operations Sergeant Major. So we had buck fever, you know, and you got to get over that and you got to learn to operate. And it's, that's one of the things you do before you get into the fight, over. You know, the scariest thing that happened in the whole damn thing for me is we were, it was oh dark 30 in the morning. I mean, it, it was like foggy or overcast or something a little bit, I can't remember. And I roll up over this berm and there's a, a T-72 sitting there with its gun tube pointing right at my Bradley. I mean, I'm talking 100 meters away. I didn't realize it was an abandoned one. And then my uh, loader who's in the back, he said, Sarnellis, Sarnellis, they're attacking. And I look back and this Apache outfit was doing a gun run on my Bradley. They never shot. <laughs> I guess they had some good vehicle ID because they'd done a gun run on me. And as all I could all we, all we could do is look up there and watch. Jerry ought to know they did shoot at General Tom Raymond and he was not happy. Oh my God. They, yeah, I, they, thought, they I, I honestly thought we were gone then. I thought, well, you know what? 
man, I mean, they were doing a gun run on us. I said, oh, my God, here we go. We're done. Well, and and, F, and point of fact, the Apaches did shoot up two uh, two Bradleys of the one four one infantry. Uh, up yeah, I, I I know the accidental <laughs> shooting up was happening. That's why I thought we were uh, we were toast. To tell you the truth. All right. Um, I think this is going to be our last question. I know we have a lot of really wonderful stories that were shared with me, and please know, and a lot of people saying hello. Um, could you just know that I'm going to send these all over to these gentlemen so they can see who was saying hello tonight. So I'll send this over to you gentlemen tomorrow, all these, all these comments from your fellow soldiers who are saying hello and sharing stories with us tonight. Um, so you had mentioned the passage of lines and can you talk a little bit more about what the tactics are there? Bob, you want to take that one? Well, sure. I mean, it, it, so there, there, there's doctrine for passage of lines, and we had practiced that before in training uh, back at Fort Riley. Um, you know, both the, the the unit that's going forward and the passing unit that, that's conducting the pass. And uh, I, I commanded a squadron in Second Cav uh, subsequently, and that was that's a that is a huge Cav mission uh, to do a forward pass, but. The challenge that we had that night was I had never seen anything like it on that scale. We're, we're you know, the entire brigade, you know, in our case, first brigade and our battalion and, <clears throat> excuse me, the sister battalion off to the right is doing this. And the conditions are just lousy. Uh, you know, as we described, the visibility is, is, is poor. Uh, second cab has been in contact. So, you know, there are shot up Iraqi vehicles. Uh, you know that we had seen and and so we were we were trained in the doctrine of the passage of lines and we'd done it on a much smaller scale but we'd never done anything like this before i mean this was just epic and uh it it, it was a huge challenge that night um it really was and i think it's a tribute to the professionalism of the second cavalry regiment that it went as well as it did uh-oh, sounds like we're losing Jerry for a second there. Jerry, give it a second and let's try again. All uh, right, can you hear me? There we go. Okay, I had an old decrepit guy tell me one time that that battle there was nothing more than organized chaos. Hmm. His name was uh, Greg Fontenot, by the way. Yes, it was chaotic, Jerry. <laughs> Organized always, chaos. I'll never yeah. forget that. Organized yeah. chaos. Well, you know, uh, I didn't know this at the time, but I read later that General Bruce C. Clark said the role of generals was to keep the chaos from getting disorganized. <laughs> so, you know, anybody, these guys that are listening that are from the 1st Empty Division, God bless all of you, because the 1st Division uh, did a heck of a job. Uh, it was busy as heck. We had great units. Second, uh, our second brigade was in reserve that night, but they had a hell of a fight the next day in a place called the Valley of the Boogers. And the second brigade, uh, you know, they don't they don't need to back up to the pay window. The third brigade did a hell of a job. Our artillery was fantastic, and we never ran out of anything. We absolutely had to have until the last day of the war. We ran out of water and food on the last day of the war. One of the most entertaining things on the planet was when a C-130 tried to airdrop bottled water. Anybody <laughs> that knows anything about parachutes know you land at a, like jumping off a two-story building and the water <laughs> blew up and little birds flew for miles around to drink it, but none of us got it. And, and over to you, I'm sorry I digressed. No, absolutely perfect. Um, as we wrap up tonight's presentation, uh, if you have any messages to any of our veterans who are speaking today, if you're a veteran yourself and you want to say something to them um, or share something, now is the time to drop it in the chat. I will be sharing this chat um, line with all of our, our veteran speakers today so they'll be able to see it. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to not just the gentlemen who shared their stories with us this evening, but to all of our Desert Storm Desert Shield veterans who are tuning in tonight to listen um, and who should continue to share those stories with people today. Um, I want to say a very special thank you. Welcome home. We're so happy to be sharing. It's one of the great privileges of my career is to be able to share the stories of the soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division. So I'm very happy to bring this with you tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody so much.
I hope that you are able to join us at a future virtual presentation or one of our events that are happening in person at the First Division Museum. You can see those all on the website, so feel free. I had one final question I do want to end with tonight, which is a more of a logistics question, and that is, is this presentation going to be recorded? It is being recorded. Um, I will be able to share a link with you if you'd like to uh, share this presentation with others or if you'd like to watch it again. Um, you can either do that by waiting about a week or so and then it will be um, on our YouTube channel or you can go ahead and send me an email directly and I will personally email you a direct link once it is available. Everybody in this group right now should have my email address. The uh, link that you use to sign into the presentation tonight, if you reply to that, it should go great, straight to the L Sears, just like the department store at for fdmuseum.org. I will personally send you a link once it is available. Just give our communications team who puts the videos together about a week to do it and then we'll have it over to you shortly. Thank you again, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for sharing your stories with us, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Laura. No, thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure working with this group of gentlemen this week. So um, thank you all so much. I feel like I'm going to miss you guys. I got so one like thing to say, you. Laura. Yeah, Jerry, I hope we get to see you guys at the museum soon or at the next future bro reunion. I'll get to see all of you. Okay, train, train, train. And when you train, you train like it's the real thing. That's all I got to say. Good advice, Jerry. A hey, big right. shout out to Jim Goff, uh, who was a thoracic surgeon and a battalion surgeon, 234 Armor. He's uh, running a VA facility now, and he has some good stuff on the chat line for you guys if you haven't seen it yep. on Gulf War illness. Thanks. And I'll be sure to send that over to you, gentlemen, um, probably tomorrow morning. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, guys. Bye, bye, Ted. Bye, Bob. Good bye, Jerry. Everybody. Bye, Greg. Good night, all. Good night, all. <laughs>